The great explorer Marco Polo wrote of Mongolia in 1256 AD. There are great numbers of wild beasts, among others, wild sheep of great size, whose horns are good, six palms in length. This plain is called Gobi, and you ride across it for 12 days together, finding nothing but desert without habitation or any green thing. So the travelers are obligated to carry with them whatsoever they have need of. We're gonna start off with Dad kind of telling us how we came about going to Mongolia and how this whole adventure started and how we ended up targeting such an odd place. Back when I was 12 years old, my dad had an extensive library of books that were done by people like Roosevelt and Clark that went to Mongolia, went to uh, up there in the Himalayas hunting sheep. And my dad would sit there at nights and tell stories about these, these explorers taking Ovis poli, taking Ovis almond almond, these huge sheep. And I got really interested, so my dad uh, allowed me to read these books, and, and I always wanted to go to Mongolia. And I talked my two sons into going there on a hunt and uh, it was quite an adventure. When you arrive on the plane in Altai on a dirt strip, it has a little cement bunker for an airport. Altai. And it is something else. So now we're leaving Altai and we're gonna head across the Gobi Desert in one of the Soviet Union's only mechanical marvels, <laughs> the Jeep. Yeah. 12 hours on a two track dirt road. Yeah. And across oh. the Gobi Desert. There's four of us, four Americans, and the driver in this little Jeep, and, un and the driver doesn't speak a lick of English. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> and then what would happen every 50 miles? It would overheat, and we sit there, he opens the hood up, and he smokes a cigarette, and then he starts pouring water about the third or second time, he starts pouring water on on all the fuel lines and... and well, the, the fuel pump. Yeah, fuel cool pump. Cool it down so it quit vapor locking, and off we go again. <laughs> well, then, well, after the break, we're going to head out to camp and start the hunt. <laughs> you get to bed at midnight, they get you up at three. <laughs> and uh, you head out, eat breakfast. We hunted for a day, hot during the day, and then you started to get sick. Yeah, I got really sick. They had Ibex spotted, but I go, I can't make it. I mean, I'm sitting there, it's really bad. You got the sickest of all of us, and that's why, you know, your hunt came to a screeching halt, and you spent three days. two days, three days in bed. Three days well, in bed. Well, three days in the year in, in the bathroom. I'm sitting there going, okay, we have to build a TV show. This is me filming my own kill scene. Should be interesting. How do I film myself hunting? And so, you know, it, it came to the point where I, the only one that I can communicate with is the interpreter. And fortunate for us is this interpreter has a stake in it because he owns part of the outfitting company. And so I convinced him to film for me and just kind of show him how to run the camera and all that stuff. And, and he, he did a great job considering he's never filmed a hunt ever before. I mean, we pulled it off as good as you could pull it off with somebody that doesn't speak hardly any English or very rough English and uh, got a kill scene. Who's thinking up to him right now? It's already recording. It's on, ready, it's, it's running. Just leave it like that. very long day. Oh my gosh, that was a long day. We started walking at seven in the morning and went up over that 10,000 foot peak. 
they have a lot of the same animals we do here. Mm -hmm. They have wolves. You missed a wolf. Yeah. You yeah. shot a wolf. Yeah. We, they peeked up. We peeked up over this ridge and we're looking for ibex. And the guide says wolves. And I thought wolves? Are you kidding me? And I looked down there and they're laying there right above a herd of elk. The elk are bedded down too. It's in the middle of the day and the wolves are right above the elk laying in the shadows in the shade. I'm sure waiting for the elk to get up and start feeding. They were going to hunt them until I started shooting at them. <laughs> but I missed them. I can't believe it. I missed the wolves. It was tough hunting. I mean, yeah. I, I expected, we, we were told that, that we would see plenty of ibex and we didn't. You know, I think they did lose a lot of ibex in the winter there. Yeah. Well, they had that, that real bad winter of 2010. It looked like the 1994 winter came along the winter range over there, Pine Dill and Big Piney with all the dead deer. We were eating lunch and I found one on the side of a hill of my binoculars and said, man, there's a really nice one in Boggy. The, Interpreter said, oh yeah, no, the guide said there's a bigger one down there. And I'm looking, and I start looking close, and they're all over this bottom with these boulders. Well, this is a interesting little find. Not to mention, this one's huge, but there are four dead ibex just in this area in these rocks. Um, a nanny and an old billy up top, and then these two billies down here, so... I'm thinking there could be a pair of snow leopards living in these rocks. And I thought I saw a cat track on our way down here, so. At first I thought it was winter kills and I looked at one of them and still had meat on the skull. Hmm. I'm like, well, that's not winter kill. They're killing them right now. And one of them down there was a giant. John and I pulled it out and hauled it clear to the top and I measured it, I can't remember exactly what it was. I mean, you're talking, he's a 49 to 50, maybe 51 inch. Ibex when he was alive, just an absolute giant. I'm guessing they're right down below there. Of course, we don't really know what's going on because I don't speak Mongol. They didn't understand a lot of English, and there was a real language barrier because the guides or the people would be going 100 miles an hour in Mongolian language and you couldn't understand what they were saying. I mean, we're seeing Ibex, they see a big one. So you walk around those hills about 80% clueless all the time. What's he saying? Yeah. It's a game yeah, at one point, you know, John's trying to film everything and, and we spooked some Ibex and, and pretty soon the, the Mongolians were convinced that these cameras were voodoo and they are ruining the hunt and they just said, no more filming, we just shoot. This is, this is next time shooting only. Because of because of the film that they spooked. They spooked because of the film. I can't imagine saying something so absurd to an Eastman, but they obviously... Yeah, didn't get that memo. So we said, if there's no cameras, put us on an airplane and we're getting out of here. We're going back to Wyoming and we're going to go hunt antelope. <laughs> um, but, you know, we finally got that part straightened out. And then we started, you know, getting more into the hunt and people start feeling better that we're sick and, you know, seeing a few more Ibex and, and things started happening and the cameras weren't such voodoo to them. But it took a little educational process on that. Right side, right side, right side, right side, yeah, right side, 
facing us. See us. Facing us. See us. Facing us. Ready, Sean. Yep. Oh, good. Well, here he is. This is the, the billy we got on the last day. Mongolia was good to us on the last day of the hunt. Well, there you have it now. Uh, all of you know the, the entire, or as near to entire adventure as, as possible about our Mongolian trip. Everybody's got their own adventure, their own ideas, and their own dreams. So that's, uh, that's been one of ours, and, and we've got that one in the books and completed. Now we're off on to the next one. We took our Western hunting tactics out here to Mongolia and proved that they even work here in Asia. So remember, fair chase is the only way to hunt and take trophy big game. We'll see you next week right here on Eastman's Hunting TV.